Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Heinz's Friday afternoon webinar. Where else would you rather be on a Friday <laughs> afternoon, frankly? Uh, I'm Chris Heinz from Heinz Legal, naturally. Uh, thanks very much everybody for tuning in today. As always, please like and share. That would be greatly appreciated and really appreciate your ongoing support and interest in our webinar series. As always, I have with me today Frank Higginson, partner at Heinz. Frank. Hello, welcome. everyone. Thank you, mate. And today, uh, making her Heinz Legal webinar debut, uh, Senior Associate Bronwyn Rule. Bronwyn. Hi, welcome. everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bronwyn is one of, well, not one of, is the newest member of the Heinz family. Um, Bronwyn, do you want to give uh, a 15 second overview? Sure. Um, I enjoy problem solving and I particularly enjoy problem solving in this strata world. And luckily for me, there are plenty of problems to solve. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Bronwyn. Uh, Bronwyn is joining us today, not only because she loves our webinar series, but because we're talking about the pretty vexing issue of building defects in strata today. And Bronwyn happens to have uh, significant amount of expertise on the topic. Uh, so um, with that, we'll rip into it. And I guess we'll sort of kick off by saying that, you know, when you talk about building defects, let's just think about that phrase for a second, defect. Uh, I mean, the word defect by itself is a pretty significant word and it's got all sorts of connotations to it. You add the you add the word building in front of it and suddenly that takes on a whole lot of other connotations also. Um, it's been a big issue in recent times in Strata. Uh, the most obvious example of that is the Opal Tower in Sydney. There have been others as well. Um, it's a very, very tangled web, isn't it, Frank uh, and Bronwyn? Yeah. Lots of moving parts. Lots of moving parts. parts. And, and it's, it's, I suppose for me in Strata, um, this is where Bronwyn's expertise is certainly more than mine. It's just horribly stressful in terms of trying to understand where to start. That, that, you know, it, it's, and this is one of the issues I suppose we have um, in the strata industry as a whole, is the committee are a bunch of volunteers with a bunch of disparate skill sets from anywhere. Not many of them are engineers, lawyers, builders, um, and they get lumbered with the responsibility to deal with what could be potentially major issues um, and a vacuum of information. Yeah, it's definitely a hot and vexing topic and, Part of the issue is that oftentimes there won't be anyone on the committee who has particular expertise in this area. And not only hot and vexing, but of course, there's significant amount of cost uh, involved there. It's not just financial cost, uh, of course. There's there are, we already alluded to the emotional costs involved. Think about that. I think that emotional cost is actually really important to sort of dwell on just for a second. This is somebody's home. This is somebody who has spent a significant amount of money, probably the most amount of money they will ever spend on their home, only to then have somebody turn around and say, by the way, the home or the greater scheme in which you in which your home is located, it's defective and it needs a significant amount of work. That is a huge emotional blow for anybody to take. I think. And the other part of that, don't forget too, is the impact on resale uh, as well thereafter. If there's a building defect or a set of building defects, that makes resale that much more difficult into the future. Um, I suppose important too, to just sort of separate things out just a wee bit. Pines is a body corporate law firm. Our interest in this is building defects as they relate to bodies corporate. But when it comes to actual building matters in Queensland, uh, the regulatory body is what's called the Queensland Building and Construction Commission. And there are equivalent ones in different states. But let's just be clear, we're only talking about Queensland here today. Uh, so, Robin, my throw to you then. I mean, what's what's the state of play for bodies corporate and, and defects? Where, 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 What is actually a defect? What are we talking about? So the QBCC works off um, a definition of building defects. That is where they contravene the uh, Building Code of Australia or the Plumbing Code of Australia, and they produce a helpful guideline which sets out standards and tolerances. A defect is something that doesn't actually meet one of those things. Yeah, that's how right. How subjective are those assessments? 
Because, I mean, you get reports for everyone and everyone gets unhappy. And I think probably one of the criticisms that um, get levelled or you see quite often is that there's probably more warranties in relation to the toaster you buy at David Jones than you do with respect to your $600,000 unit in the building. Um, and it's dealing with these things afterwards. So, like, there's lots of there's lots of opinion that can come around whether something is defective or not, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. ultimately, from at least the QBCC forum, it's an inspector who will make a determination and produce a report. Um, the parties have the opportunity to apply for a review of that either to the QBCC or to QCAT. Let's also, I think, also let's um, clarify that what we're talking about here is, uh, as Bronwyn and Frank talked about, there's a, a definition of defect. Uh, we're not so much talking about the body corporate's obligation to maintain common property, although that's certainly part of the discussion. Um, maybe this is a good moment to actually talk about that. So, Frank, what, so. Are a, what are a body corporate? What is a body corporate's obligation? Effectively, um, to maintain the common property in good condition. If you want an overriding global statement, there's a whole bunch of detail that flows behind that. But I think bodies corporate's... Um, in our own houses, uh, we can let stuff go to rack and ruin. I don't need to repair the driveway. I can let the gutters fall off. Um, I don't need to maintain gardens and grounds. That's my choice. But a body corporate doesn't have that same choice. It must maintain those things. So probably one of the other things we get from a defects perspective quite a bit is there's issues, and I suppose, you know, we talk about limitation periods in a minute and all that sort of stuff. Well, actually, Frank, got... Frank let, let's pick up that point, and I'll play devil's advocate for both you and Bronwyn on this one. You just said, can't leave that to rack and ruin. Um, why can't I? Why can't I, as a line owner, put up my hand and say, you know what? Sure, there's a problem there, but I'm opting to not do anything about it. That's my right, surely, isn't it? No. You've got a statutory obligation to do something about it. And even more importantly, then, that overriding obligation for a body corporate to act reasonably in everything it does. So even if an entire building decides, well, not building, 40 lot owners, 39 of them say, you know what, we're not going to deal with this. We just stick our heads in the sand and hope it goes away. That 40th owner would be well and truly within their rights to make an application to your former office, Chris, for the appointment of an administrator to actually do what the body corporate statutory obligations are. You know, so, uh, in other words, it's all about that idea of collective collective interest and collective decision-making, isn't it, Bronwyn? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what are we actually talking about in terms of some of the factors that the body corporate has to take into account, the decision-making? And I guess one of the big things is about the commerciality at play in pursuing building defects. It's it's about weighing up the cost and benefit, isn't it, Bronwyn? Yeah, that's right. Um, and I think in order, though, to make that assessment, a body corporate should obtain an expert report so that they're informed about what defects exist in the building um, and what the likely cost is to repair. And then armed with that information, they're going to be able to make the appropriate decision acting reasonably. What do you think, Frank? Um, I agree. Yeah. I think it, this, like, um, what we really like to do as a business is provide fixed fees. In building defect stuff, that becomes a lot harder. You can do it in certain stages, but when it comes to big, lumpy um, expert reports, what's a defect? What's the QBCC going to do? How do we approach these things? It's really difficult. So, um, I suppose the starting point is this can be expensive. Um, and probably this, again, is the difficulty is in terms of what's, what's the right level of you know, we've got $50,000 worth of defects. To me, it is pointless spending $100,000 trying to recover those. Um, but it certainly starts, as Bronwyn says, is understanding what, what the now is. You know, the now where, how. Like, we've got the now position, we have problems. The where position is we want to get rid of those problems. And part of what we're talking about today is the how. And that might be as simple as that might be. I think it starts with an expert report. Then it's a very careful assessment about what you actually do next. Do you QBCC? Do you try to look at a civil claim? Do you just, for a better phrase, suck it up, spend the money, do it, and get on with everyone's lives? Because again, I suppose you go back to our defamation, defamation webinar a couple of weeks ago, litigation is horrendous. 
Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Though, so, um, as a first step, once a body corporate is armed with an expert report, it's likely to be relatively inexpensive for them to lodge a complaint with the QBCC and have an inspector determine whether or not the work is defective. Let's yeah. talk about let's talk about that the issue that defective. What, uh, Brahman, are there some more common examples of what a building defect is that the body corporate would consider? Yep, so um, the QBCC categorises defects into two types, um, structural and non-structural. So an example of non-structural would be a sticking door, um, whereas an example of a structural defect would be water ingress, for example, through a leaking roof. Okay, so the the high profile cases that we've heard about over time, so the large cracks appearing, uh, and that was Opal Tower, that's very much in the category of structural, isn't it? That's right. And there's a longer time frame to make a complaint to the QBCC about structural defects than there is more minor issues. And um, if the inspector agrees that they're a defect, then they can issue a direction to rectify to the contractor. What's that time frame, Roman? Did I know I'm putting you on the spot here? <laughs> you know, so um, within 12 months, um, as, as a rough rule, there's more specific timeframes um, because the QBCC also runs a homeowner's right. warranty scheme. So where the contractor doesn't come to the party and rectify, pursuant to a direction to rectify, a scheme might be covered by the homeowner's warranty insurance, which would actually pay for it, that, that work to be performed. In order to be covered, they have to be uh, three stories or less, and that doesn't um, include a basement car park. We've talked a lot about the process and, and what to do. And Frank, sort of, and Frank talked about the need to get an expert report and then to, and you did as well, Bronwyn, and the need to evaluate options at that point. And I guess it makes sense, doesn't it, that if your first expert report is a little inconclusive or throws up some statements that the body corporate is either unclear about or needs a bit more information than perhaps a second, does a second or third opinion get required in those instances? Advice shopping, it's unreal. Uh, um, I suppose, like in, and, and like anything for me, these, th these are not small matters. You know, it's not a $2,000 get in, get out type advice thing. It's really um, whoever you're going to engage, you need to actually have a relationship with. So my take would be rather than sort of um, advice shopping and I suppose this is interesting everyone we have not prepped this beforehand so Bronwyn might have a different view and she's completely entitled to express it my my take would be um, I'd be probably going back to the first person who asked them to nail down a little bit more where they were coming from what the actual issues were um, and asking them to address whatever deficiencies might be in the report than potentially get a second one or even a third one you know leaving aside the cost um, at the end of the day you're going to have to prove, I suppose, um, beyond reasonable doubt if you got to the stage of um, oh, the balance of probabilities, I'm in the wrong jurisdiction, um, what actually has happened. So I think you've just got to, yeah, back the horse you're with. And I don't know, Bron, but what have you seen in your prior lives? Is, is people getting different versions? So I agree that you don't necessarily want to throw further money at it but for a body corporate that's looking at getting its first report I think it's really important to identify someone who has the requisite expertise in that area and use them. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I just, I know it, it's funny. It's same as you get sometimes clients come in and you're on your, they're on their third or their fourth lawyer and it's particularly when the other side of a matter you absolutely know for sure they're not getting told what they want or they're really difficult people or both. So that that from the other side of the matter is usually a good sign. So it's probably that, that forum shopping can be really dangerous. Uh. I think important to remember too that ultimately the QBCC makes its own decision. So really the purpose of the report is to make sure that you can include all the uh, defective items so that the QBCC can consider them. They won't necessarily agree with the report that you've obtained. So you, everyone gets a chance to make submissions to the QBCC, both, I suppose, developer, um, builder, body corporate, and then the inspector is almost 
the final decision maker, yeah? Yeah, it's a relatively uh, informal process. So it might only consist of uh, people making comments at the inspection. Robin, tell, right. us, about, tell us about the three storey limit. Pretty, a pretty important point for bodies corporate. Yeah, so um, if you're over that, then uh, the QBCC can still issue a direction to rectify in respect of defective work, but that scheme won't be covered by the homeowner's warranty scheme. Yeah, because that that issue comes up a lot, doesn't it? And you hear people say, obviously, people in high rise who own in high rises saying that, well, our only option is to pursue some legal proceedings, which we'll get into shortly. Uh, but that um, so that's three stories, uh, not including any basement level car parks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. So, we, I mean, we've talked uh, about a few different aspects to all this. Uh, Bronwyn, do you want to just step us through the process? So we start from uh, a point where, uh, be it an owner or a committee member or even a caretaker, notices a problem, whatever that might be. So that's the first, the first notice, the first um, whatever you want to call it. Step us through how that process actually works and what are, what are the actions that happen? So because we're dealing with common property here today, the first step would be to report that to the committee. Um, and the committee then um, armed with that information can um, preferably get a report so that they're dealing with all of the defects that might exist. And then um, it's usual to write to the developer to request that they rectify. And I, I strongly encourage our viewers if they're in this situation to try and work with the developer to get a, a mutually agreed outcome in relation to the defects. Um, if that, that doesn't work or they're running short of time to meet the timeframes, then um, you complete a complaint to the QBCC, um, attach relevant information, including any report that you've received and that will then be assessed by the QBCC and um, most commonly um, an inspection will be scheduled. And following that, the QBCC makes a decision. And then as we said before, what, that decision then triggers the next set of actions which might result from there. Yep, so um, they'll uh, either conclude that work is defective or not and um, if they're within time, they'll issue directions to rectify in respect of defective work to the contractor. I think important just to sort of go back a couple of steps there and, and uh, emphasise a point that you just made, Bronwyn, about this is uh, the body corporate is responsible for the maintenance of common property. And so um, I know that when I was commissioner, we would occasionally get calls from lot owners who would say, look, there's a clear problem or a defect in our building, but we can't get the committee to take action to go to the QBCC to make that happen. Um, so that, I suppose, highlights the fact that regardless of the fact that we're talking about building defects, we're actually still talking about body corporate decision making, aren't we? The fact mm -hmm. that it's not just um, one entity unilaterally going off and doing something um, or, or, or is, uh, I'm assuming, Bronwyn, that that's the case. It, it requires um, the committee to lodge that complaint with the B QBCC? Yeah, so I've had some slightly different approaches taken in relation to this by the QBCC. Um, I suppose the best advice I have in that situation is to follow through processes such as the Commissioner's Office to get the, to try and get the committee to make the complaint so that it's properly made and there can't be any dispute about that. But as a backup, I would also say put in your own complaint to the QBCC so at, at least you can try and say it was lodged within time. Yeah. And interestingly, Chris, I suppose, in the strata law reform that got derailed just before COVID arrived, um, I suppose as COVID arrived, there was a proposal to require bodies corporates to have on their agenda, I think, for their second AGM, um, yep. an actual statutory motion to go and seek a building um, inspection report looking yep. for defects in new buildings to sort of really, I suppose, get it on the agenda. 
literally and figuratively. Yeah. So that, that, that was going to be one of government's responses to some of these issues that bodies corporate face. Um, but as Frank said, that hasn't happened. When will that happen? Well, that's anyone's guess at this point. Um, so everything that we're talking about today is action and information which exists in the here and now and is not existing in a theoretical construct. Um, so we talked about that process, but what about the need to lawyer up then and go for a civil claim? What What's involved there, Frank and Bronwyn? This oh, is getting serious. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, has been made uh, difficult by Brookfield Multiplex High Court decision, which um, found that a contractor didn't owe a duty of care to a body corporate. Um, it's also difficult contractually because there's no contract between the body corporate and the contractor. The developer would have entered into the building contract with the contractor. Um, there is a section in the BCCM Act which um, entitles a body corporate to step into the shoes of a developer, as it were. Um, so, but that's untested, so we don't know exactly how that would work um, and what that would offer a body corporate. And then I suppose your claim really relates to contract, which quite often bodies corporates don't actually have, do they? That's, um, you know, there's there's usual first first EGM minutes usually will refer to the developer undertaking to deliver a whole bunch of information within a specified period. Um, and quite often that's not followed through on. So the first issue we always have is getting access to whatever the contract was between whoever the parties were. So if there was defective work, who's responsible depends on scopes of works, um, retainers and the actual specifications required. You know, and then you're sort of into, I suppose, architects, builders, design consultants, whatever it might be. So yeah, it's yeah. Re records is generally speaking always, or, or accessing records is generally always the first step in resolving any body corporate related dispute, isn't it? Mm. It's about how, transparently having the information in front of you to be able to proceed from that point, which is a nice segue to the next point, which is that, again, what one of the uh, reforms to legislation proposed was that there was going to be a greater obligation on developers to hand over documents, wasn't there, Frank? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I suppose uh, that, that was a really interesting process for me. I was in the, the room where we were talking with the bureaucrats of which you at that stage were one um, yeah. representing the commissioner's office about what the legislation might look like and what they'd considered and what they hadn't and, and all that sort of stuff. So um, there were going to be, and I suppose there still will be, a bunch of additional obligations on developers to produce information. But again, when that becomes law, that's great for buildings that are registered after that date, but for anyone yeah the previous six years now, you're stuck with the same regime that we have to battle through every day. And I suppose the other thing, just sorry, Bronwyn, is um, this is commencing proceedings is definitely something that doesn't happen at committee level. That requires a special resolution at general meeting. Absolutely. And um, I suppose uh, too, from a QBCC complaint perspective, having the contractual documents is less important because they are only going to be interested in the codes that I mentioned earlier. So for example, if the requirement under the contract was to paint the building white and they've painted it red, while you may have rights under the contract about that, the QBCC won't be interested in that type of um, issue. As long as it's been painted properly, I suppose, meets the, right. the BCA code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I think that that last point is, is worth emphasising that if there are going to be uh, legal proceedings initiated, it is going to require a special resolution at a general meeting. And there also needs to be uh, appropriate funds to pay for it too. Uh, and that might mean a special levy to be raised, which comes... Ordinarily. Yep. Well. And that comes back to the point that we were talking about before about costs and benefits and, and uh, what benefits is to be gained at what cost. A very difficult uh, situation, that one, and a special resolution isn't necessarily that straightforward to achieve either. So therein might lie, and again, as you said before, Bronwyn, that of itself may trigger an application to the Commissioner's Office to have any decisions made there uh, reviewed and challenged. Yeah. 
Um, in the short amount of time that we have left today, a uh, couple of things to sort of uh, go over. We've talked a lot about today about the process, QBCC, legal proceedings, the steps to go through, but what about practical side of things? What about the preventative and just sort of the on the ground stuff that a body corporate can do? Um, I mean, for me, one of the most obvious points that emerges out of this discussion is that the body corporate should always and continually be reminded of its obligations to maintain common property. And that actually also means its obligations to do that methodically and to do it routinely. So um, uh, in quite large bodies corporate and even relatively small ones too, uh, there are routinely commissioned a series of reports about the building, about common property and about what work needs to be done. Because don't forget, it's that anticipated work which uh, goes towards uh, the body corporate figuring out what budget it needs. So uh, at its most fundamental level, and Frank and Robin are interested in your views on this, it's it's all about the body corporate carrying out its responsibilities, but doing so in a regular methodical way, it strikes me. Yeah, and um, I've seen some really good results, particularly in newer schemes of committees working with the developer slash builder to rectify defects without needing to go to the QBCC and make any complaint. So I think um, engaging with the developer and contract, keeping the lines of communication open and, and being reasonable too in relation to what you're expecting. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I suppose... Um, and I'll be the cynic in this, uh, developers are good at playing the game. They know the game. They're good at, at deferring and, and obfuscating and, yeah, sure, mate, I'll get to that soon and moving on to the next thing. And before you know it, you're three or four years down the track yeah. and you've lost. You're losing potential rights. Things aren't getting better. Um, and that's the, the, I think, the thing that, that these, you know, we're talking about a, a group of things together. But for me, I suppose, that statutory obligation to, keep the common property in a good condition is independent of any right that there might be to have QBCC as a direction, the right to recover the cost of doing that from someone else. The body corporate's got to do that, whether it can get some recompense from someone else in relation to why that's required is something else entirely. So you can't just simply stick your head in the sand, hope it goes away, hope the developer comes good at some stage. And this is, again, one of the problems with, I suppose, it's volunteer committees. Um, everyone's got other things that are important in their lives. But if you're, if you're on a new buildings committee, mm. these are the issues that you are going to have to deal with. And the head in the sand approach um, just kicks the can down the road. It doesn't make the problem go away. No, I'll be a lawyer now and caveat my uh, earlier comment by saying that while you're having those discussions, you must calculate and diarise the timeframes and make sure that you act regardless of what the developer or contractor might be telling you they're going to do. And actually, we've got a really good guide on our website too, Chris. I think if people want to, at some stage, you're watching this at some later stage, download that and have a look. It um, goes into a lot more detail than what we're talking about today, but just in a different way. Good point, Frank, because I think, I'm sure people are thoroughly sick and tired of hearing me say that every case is different, but it's especially true, I think, in this instance, every mm. defect, every building defect instance is going to be different. And while we've talked about a fairly kind of step-by-step -step process that everyone's eventually going to go through, how that works, the timeframes, um, what's involved, who's involved, the degree to which, as you said, Bronwyn, they want to engage or they don't want to engage is going to be very different in each particular case. So you just have to bear that in mind. And interestingly, we come back to the same point we always come back to in any body corporate issue. It's communication. It's about whether you're communicate, whether as a committee you're communicating back to owners or owners you're communicating to your committee about the defect or to your caretaker or whether you are simply as a committee communicating to owners the progress that you are making in following up the building defect. This, it's just so essential to not only maintain a regularity of communication, but the transparency of it as well. Um, 
we have more or less reached the end of today's allocation. Um, probably one thing I would say is that the building defects issue can appear pretty insurmountable and pretty huge to a volunteer committee. So if there's any aspect of building defects that you think we need to cover off in a bit more detail, leave us a comment on our Facebook page uh, and we can weave that into a future webinar. Uh, the link for next, to register for next week will be up on our Facebook page, or it's up there now. Uh, and that's just a really neat way to be reminded. Uh, and we release the actual topic during the week. With that, I'd like to thank Robin. Thank you for your debut. I hope it wasn't thank too traumatising. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Frank, as always, um, I'm sure you were traumatised somehow, but. Uh, oh, I might have had an easy session. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> your, your resilience as is as always admirable to everybody again thank you so much for tuning in don't forget to like and share join us next friday for our next webinar but for today thanks and see you all later bye, bye, bye. everyone bye